Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. We're your hosts, Brian Edwards, Nathan Cravat. I'm JC Groves. It is good to be back with you. I know it feels like we've been here the whole month of April, but man, we recorded all that in one day. And so, guys, I, I, I've missed you. I haven't seen your faces in over a month. It has been way too long, guys. It is good to see your face and good to record again. After podcasting consistently for a year, it, it seemed like it was lasting forever. You know, the month of April is never going to be over, and then now here we are back again. It's really exciting. My wife, last week, it got to a point where I was just walking through the house about 9 o'clock at night, and I was bored out of my mind. And she goes, will you call Nathan and Brian and just go record a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, I miss them. You need to listen to Kim. She That, that girl has some wisdom, man. She really does. She really hey, does. I do want to tell you guys thank you, though, because uh, some of the time off definitely helped me. I'm officially all the way moved to South Carolina here in Anderson, recording in my new office, loving it here at Gospel Light Anderson with Chad Gamble. The dude is a legend and love him, having fun working with him. And uh, my family loves Anderson. It's awesome. Nathan, it's really exciting to hear that uh, you guys have settled in, and I know you're going to love serving with Chad. He's one of the greatest guys, uh, always upbeat, always encouraging, has a huge heart for Jesus, and uh, – Glad you guys are there and, and that you're loving it. I think great things are going to happen. Guys, I got a story for you today in Anderson, South Carolina. My daughter is in her middle school class. She's in eighth grade. So she wore her Recovering Fundamentalist podcast T-shirt to school nice. today, and she was so proud of it. She told me in the morning, she's like, look, Dad. So she goes to school, her very last class. She walks up to her teacher's desk, and her teacher goes, no way. Are you kidding me? He goes, that's my favorite podcast. I listen to it every week. And she goes, that's my dad. And he, <laughs> he, he's like, which one? So he pulled up our website and she showed him who I was. And also yesterday I was calling around some area youth pastors for our youth night, the video you saw. And one of the local youth pastors called me back and he was like, dude, I can't believe one of the hosts of the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast is calling me. So that's Man, awesome. people, people know about the RFP in Anderson and Greenville, South Carolina. It what's has really – What's the RFP? <laughs> <laughs> that recovering thing there. So I was leaving a funeral the other day, Nathan, and uh, the pastor was at the back of the auditorium. And as I walked by, I'd never met this uh, guy before. By the way, he did a remarkable job on the funeral. But as I walked by, he said – I hope I didn't say anything that makes the podcast. <laughs> That's I just awesome. started smiling. I love it. I really do think that the the ripple effect is really taking taking place. I mean, here in Statesboro, it's helped me get acquainted. There's uh, there's a police officer here that that listens. I'm meeting up with a a couple guys that are recovering fundamentalists. Andrew Wiggins, who traveled and sang the Wiggins family. I mean, they sang at Faith Baptist Camp and all that. Uh, Van Gillers. Uh, me and a couple of them guys are starting up on Saturday morning at 7 a.m. at the coffee shop with a little community group, and that all came from the podcast. And so awesome. something that I'm really excited about is meeting up with a bunch of our family that is all over the country. We've got two meetups that are going to be taking place this summer, coming up June the 4th right here in Statesboro, Georgia at the Connection Church. Um, we would love for you to be down here. That's a free event. And then August 26th through the 28th, we're going to be up in Bourbon, Missouri. Uh, man, yes. Matt Dudley, who is on the podcast tonight, man, we're going up to his his part of the country. Matt, tell us a little bit about Bourbon, Missouri. Uh, there's absolutely nothing to tell you about Bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> so we our church is in Sullivan, Missouri, which is right next to Bourbon. Um uh, but the you know we're doing the meetup at Camp Mahaska, so Camp Mahaska yeah. is owned by the Salvation Army, and it's just a cool place, man. It's super so, nice. Oh yeah, super nice. I'm excited. It'll be good. So we'd love to see you either in Georgia on June the fourth or Bourbon, Missouri, August 26th through the 28th. You can go to our website, recoveringfundamentalist.org. Right there on the main page, there's two tabs. Click on those. Justin has set it up where you can register there. Uh, there are links for motels. And, uh, man, we would love for you to come and hang out with us. We love hearing your stories. We love seeing your faces. We'd love to see you in either Statesboro, Georgia, or bourbon missouri as we love to put the real person behind the social media platform uh, that we see you on and uh, you can go to recoveringfundamentalist.org while you're there 
Click on the Free Life Soap tab. We want to thank Miss McCriven for being a sponsor of the RFP. You can check her out today. She's got the brand new Coastal Soap in that was brand new last year. It's my absolute favorite. It's the blue and white one. Man, I love it. She sent me like four bars of it. Loving me some Coastal from Free Life Soap. So go and get your Free Life Soap today. Use the promo code RFP and get 20% off of your order when you do that. Guys, I'm super excited about today's episode. Uh, We got a good friend of the RFP, Matt Dudley, is on with us for the next two episodes. Oh, yeah. And uh, he's going to share his story, and then we're going to get into some really good conversation next week. And uh, we got got the chance to meet Matt in person in Vegas. Man, we are just... We're bros for life. Like, it's it's going to be awesome. And, uh, Matt, we're excited to hear your story today. Yeah, buddy. Glad to be here, man. All right. Well, Matt, you ready to share your story? I'm ready, buddy. Let's do this. Y'all ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> You know what makes women stupid is college. Jesus was not a bartender. Hi, man. Two. You have lost your mind. Long tongue heifers have given me a lot more trouble than heifers wearing breeches. And you know that. Say amen right there. One. Let me tell you something, bozo. They'll be selling frosties in hell for this boy. Put on a pair of pink underwear. Amen. I sucked my thumb till I was 14 years of age. Hi, man. So guys, as we get this episode started, I, I want to go ahead and address Clarence Sexton, who recently, for some reason, felt the need to give us and those who are like us uh, time in his pulpit by making a ton of false accusations against us. Do you realize that Clarence Sexton from The Crown College called us God-haters? mm How does that make you feel? Stupider. <laughs> it it makes me feel like he he just yeah, doesn't care good. anything about the truth. Yeah, you know, it's unbelievable. And, and it's interesting that you would say that he doesn't care anything about the truth because my dad actually texted him hmm. and oh, asked man. him the question, why would you call my son and the other guys – God haters when that's not who they are. And the text that came back to him was, I don't call anybody a God hater. Well, Mr. Sexton, I know you had them take down that video very, very quickly, but unfortunately for you, there were people who were recording it in real time Mm -hmm. because they're smarter than that. And so, sir, you are incredibly dishonest. You called us God haters that was dishonest. Then you denied calling us God haters. That's dishonest. And then, by the way, it was also really kind of you to tell my dad to have a nice life. I thought that was very kind. Um, Man. Guys, it's just pathetic. It's ridiculous. Hmm. You know who was probably in the hot seat after that video went down? I don't know who that guy sitting behind him was, but you can tell he's definitely listened to the podcast. Oh, yeah. Did you see his face? Guilt all over it when he started talking. He's like, please don't talk about the RFP. (laughs) I got a message today from a young man that uh, said, hey, JC, I just want to let you and the guys know that I've been praying for y'all. I see all the attacks that are thrown at you, Nathan, Brian, yourself. It's got to be exhausting, but I'm praying and standing uh, with y'all, Satan hates what's going on. You guys are obviously trying your best uh, to keep everybody encouraged. He said, the podcast is the main thing that God has used to help me and my family get out of legalism. I stumbled on this podcast on day one. I've actually been a listener ever since. We now attend a Southern Baptist church. They go to Long Hollow in Nashville. Shout out Robbie oh, Gallaty wow. and Colin yeah. Wood. I used to work with Great Colin church. Wood at Brainerd Baptist. Great church. He said, I've grown more in the Lord in the last seven months than mm-hmm. I have the, re- the majority of my life. 
My wife and I both have a true walk with God and a real relationship with him. It has transformed our lives. We've always known Jesus in our heads, but there's nothing like getting to know him personally in our hearts. Now I can't get enough of my Bible. We both recently switched from the King James Version to the Christian Standard Bible and prayer. It's, It's no longer something that we're supposed to do, but now it's something that we love to do. He said, I'm rambling, but all this has started because of the podcast. We really enjoyed the Mark Lowry episodes. It opened our eyes to how much God really loves me. Thank you so much for the encouragement and the courage to make the podcast and to keep standing for truth. Praying for y'all that you would have boldness, protection, and wisdom as you keep defending truth. Wow. And that's from Ben. Man, what an encouraging JC, text. JC, that's why they're coming after us. I was thinking the other yep. day. You remember when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, Pharaoh came after them to do them harm. He showed up with the army, and his objective was to kill them all because they had left Egypt. I mm-hmm. promise you the only reason Clarence Sexton is talking about us and the only reason all of these other guys are talking about us and those other recovering fundamentalists, the army that's out there now, yeah, the only reason is. they're talking about us is because they see how many people are leaving, and their yeah. response is to come after us aggressively. Well, you got their number, boys. <laughs> that's what it is. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about the fact that, you know, I think we all listen to those clips. And, of course, our good buddy's still putting them out on YouTube. Oh, yeah. He didn't go but, away. No, but <laughs> – Man, as I listen to the stuff that they say about you in particular and then about, I call it a movement now. Y'all thought you started a podcast. You you went and started a a movement. Mm. But uh, I I think it drives them insane because you know them, but they don't know you. Yeah. Like you've, you've got them nailed to the wall, which is obvious. You know, that's why they say the stuff that they say. But it drives them crazy because all they can say, well, they're just a bunch of God denying. Bi- they don't believe the Bible. They don't believe in Jesus. It's like, come on, dude. You know, you're obviously listening, yeah. so you know better than that. And uh, anyway, they, it's you've got them tucking and running. Well, Matt, you would know that world very well because you were in it, very deep in it. And, uh, man, we're we're excited to have you on. We I know ever since Vegas we've been like, we got to get Matt Dudley on the podcast, and I think right now is a perfect time, especially with a lot of this banter that has been going on about the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. And you hit the nail on the head. It's more than just us three. There is a massive army. There is a family. There is a movement yep. of recovering fundamentalists that have risen up in this last year. And so when they say that about the podcast, they're saying it about all of us. And you're a recovering fundamentalist right there with us. And I think it would be incredible for our listeners to hear your story. And, and we would love for you to go back to the beginning because your story is deep. Uh, you were entrenched in the independent fundamental Baptist world. And uh, I really think you could give some hope and help to a lot of folks. Well, man, I got my hair cut up nice and tight above my ears, and I'm wearing my pink underwear, so I'm ready. (laughs) I knew you were a pink underwear kind of guy. Let's go. (laughs) Yeah. So, Hey, hey Matt, I do have a question I need to ask you since you said that. (laughs) You know, we've been called trendies, right? and I've had no idea what a trendy was, but I want to ask you because you're like one of the coolest, roughest, toughest guys we've ever met. Am I trendy now that I figured out that I like avocado toast? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say so. Here, here's what I want to know. I want to know when we're going to have suits versus skinny jeans go toe to toe because these guys keep calling out, you know, trendies like they want to fight, <laughs> and I don't get it. I'm like, what? I, are, and I'm joking, of course, but I keep thinking. Uh, you know what is the what's the goal? What are y'all getting at? You want to meet up, arm wrestle, you know, see who's tougher. I see, don't here's know. Here's the thing, guys. I, I, as a pastor, I'm not allowed to be a striker, which right. I believe if we exegete the Greek, that would probably mean like attacking another person. But Paul always talks about boxing and right. fighting and sports. So a gentlemanly fight, dude. I I, I think I would take on the world. With J.C. Groves, Brian Edwards, and Matt Dudley. (laughs) I love it. So, Matt, today we know that your story is, like, incredibly deep. You were immersed in fundamentalism. That's who you had prepared yourself to be. That's who you thought you would always be. So why don't you take us back to how you were introduced to fundamentalism, 
your salvation experience, uh, early ministry for you, then the radical change that took place in your life and where you are now? All right, so I was raised in church, um, a missionary Baptist church. It wasn't an independent, fundamental, King James-only church, but um, brought up in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, of course, you know, VBS, revival meetings. But when I was a teenager, I completely got out of church, got away from, you know, church life and Christian friends and um, essentially was lost the whole time. I'd been baptized when I was nine years old. And uh, lived a real rough life, was addicted to drugs. In fact, I I dealt drugs here in my hometown where I now pastor. The people I used to sell drugs to come to our church. Um, but anyway, keeping that really long story short, when I was 19 years old, um, I had started going back to church. I'd wrecked my life, man. I was on probation and just been in, in and out of trouble with the law. And uh, But I started going back to church, and, of course, the story of the gospel that I'd heard from the time I was a child began to resonate in my heart. And on a Sunday night, I slid down on my knees and um, right in my dad's living room. My dad had already gone to bed and we'd been to church twice that day. And, and I just slid down on my knees and called on, on the name of the Lord Jesus and got saved and and God radically changed my life. I, I, just to put it in a little bit of context, I was, I was at an Ozzy Osbourne concert in August of 1998 in August of 1999, I was in Bible college. So, wow. um, you know, so I got saved, radically changed, wanted to live for God more than anything else in the world. And, uh, but I was going to that missionary Baptist church and somebody, and I can't for the life of me remember who, but somebody started giving me, uh, these little cassette tapes by Jack Hiles, John R. Rice, Lester Roloff, you know, guys like that. And then I started getting the blue uh, labeled cassette tapes by this wild man named mm. Phil Kidd. Oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, I, I won't go into all the, you know, what I think to be the, maybe the psychological reasons that I was drawn into that real deep at that age. But, you know, I, I came out of a pretty wild lifestyle, you know, loud, militant in the, in the world that I lived in as a lost man. As mm. a saved guy, you know, all of a sudden I'm hearing these guys preach and I'm talking, they're rough and they're thumping the pulpit and stomping and it's authoritative and it just man it just intrigued me and so I was I was eating that up and then you know I had surrendered to preach at that church that I was going to and I, I went my first semester of college to a missionary Baptist college in Conway Arkansas but they weren't King James and you know the girls wore pants and of course I'm listening to these preaching tapes and and uh, learning why all that was wrong quote unquote and so I left that college after my first semester, went to an independent, fundamental, premillennial, separated, soul winning, King James Bible toting, scripture quoting, all that. Mm -hmm. Baptist college, Baptist with a big B, baby. Amen. And, uh, you know, finished there in another three years, got my bachelor's degree, went straight into full time evangelism. So my wife and I got married in 2002, which was, I was going into my last semester of college. I, I finished a little bit early because I took summer classes. Uh, overachiever, whatever. But um, we, I graduated the next year. And so in 2003, we went into full-time evangelism, traveled for two and a half years. I got around a lot of these guys at that time that I was listening to and, uh, and got to know them on a personal level, which was in, you know, at that time, I mean, it was like a dream come true to me to be hanging out. And I won't call their names in particular. I may say some names here in a minute, but uh, got to run a lot of big name preachers. When I was 25 years old, we started our first church in House Springs, Missouri, and uh, started an independent Baptist, you know, all that same stuff, you know, just carried that over, starting the church. This is kind of a weird part to me about about when we started the church, man, I was, I was praying about it, and uh, and I'm setting myself up for criticism here, but when when we were about to start the church, as I was praying about it, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart and said, don't touch on the King James Version and don't preach against women wearing pants. Oddly enough, because I believed that at the time, hmm. but but I, you know, God gave me enough wisdom realizing I was going to be reaching lost people and new converts. They didn't need to hear about the King James Bible and, and women in britches, praise God. Amen. And you know what? You can like that, lump that, hump that, take it across the street and dump it. 
<laughs> Shout out. <laughs> for all I care. <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, again, and I, and I believed it. My wife only wore dresses. And, uh, and, then, and then, you know, as we reached people and the church grew, you know, I did later begin – um, I, I wouldn't even say I really taught on the King James Bible. I'd say stuff like, take your King James Bible and go to John chapter 4. You yeah, know? you did. But I didn't break it down. Did you go back and listen to some old CDs or something? Maybe a few. Uh, but, you know, but I'd make those, you know, by implication. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'd make those statements. And then, of course, the guys that I'd have in to preach um, would preach on it. But every time I went to preach on, on the King James Bible, like, I, I really, really, really wanted to prove that point. Um, I, I couldn't do it. And I'm talking, that was with the aid of Gail Ripplinger, you know, Bill Grady, you know, all the greats, you know, I, I never was a Ruckmanite, so there is that. But, um, I just, I couldn't come to that conclusion. Anyway, making a long story short, as I, uh, as I progressed in the ministry, as the church grew, you know, I started having different guys in that you would, that you would know. And then, and then I started going to camp meetings and, uh, uh, so one of the guys that really drew me in was, was Tony Hudson and, uh, where I went to Bible college, I won't call the name of the college, but it was kind of a little Hiles, you know, it was, it was, uh, the pastor had gone to Hiles Anderson. The, the guy that started the college and the church was good friends with Jack Hiles and would have him in. And so it was kind of a little mini Hiles, um, Bible college and, but, but they were real rigid with their music. You know, everything was, oh, you know, oval mouthed and, <laughs> and had to, you know, you couldn't slide your notes and that kind of had to be careful how you hold your hold mic, your you know, yes. yeah, that kind of stuff. So man, when I first heard Tony Hudson preach, it was, believe it or not, you know, it was a breath of fresh air yeah. because I was like, who is this guy? You know, he was, he was saying crazy stuff. He was loud talking about biscuits sopping, you know, and I mean, I was like, I love this dude. And so I was very, you know, young as a pastor. I never pastored. I never trained actually to be a pastor. I thought I was going to be an evangelist my whole life. Um, so I had actually reached out to Tony. Back then you would listen, if you wanted to listen to sermons online, you would go to their church website. So I'd go and, and listen to Tony preach on, on the, their church website. Well, one day I, I emailed him and I just said, hey, uh, told him who I was. I'm a young pastor, started my first church. Uh, love what you do. I'd love to maybe come and observe sometime and just kind of learn. And, and man, I got a phone call you know, like two weeks later. It was on a Wednesday night, and I answered my phone right before church. And I, on the other on the other end of the phone, I hear, is this brother Matt? This is, this is Tony. I was like, what? And it was Tony Hudson called me. <laughs> he in, he invited us down and uh, put my wife and I in a hotel. Was very kind to us. Let us come down and and visit. And I just kind of shadowed him around the church. Um, but but through that, okay. So their music was way different, right? Like their their music was banjo, mandolin, bass guitar, piano. You know, mm -hmm. they they slid their notes and. And uh, I loved it, and so I was having conversations with him about, you know, where I came from, and I, and, and I said, man, you know, you couldn't slide notes, and, oh, that's a bunch of junk, and praise God, you can worship God on a mandolin and a fiddle, and, you know, and, and to be honest, like, he helped me come out of of some of that that mindset wow. of it has to be this way. And, uh, and so then of course our church, you know, we, we went, you know, more Southern and, and country style gospel and, 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 and really we, <laughs> in the middle of Missouri, man, we had like a little, little camp meeting type church shouting. I'm talking, dude, people'd come in and visit and, uh, they couldn't believe how loud that church would sing and shout and, you know, and so of course Tony'd come and preach. Anyway, you know, I got deeply ensconced in that, started preaching for Tony, um, you know, he'd have me in at his camp meeting. Matter of fact, first time I ever preached at, at, at his camp meeting, he called me straight up from the floor and, um, uh, it's kind of a funny story. You can edit this if you want to, but, uh, he, he got up in camp meeting one time and he said, he goes, I'm fixing to do something I'll never do. And he went on, I'll never, ever do this, but he goes, I'm fixing to call on a brother. I never heard preach. And I thought, Oh man, he's going to call on me. And he called, he called me up there to preach. And, uh, so he's talking about how nervous he was about it. So I got up in the microphone and I go, brothers, take your Bibles and go to the book of Psalms. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> man! He turned and looked at me all crazy. Anyway, wound up preaching, and uh, we we became good buddies, and and I'd preach there for him, and 
Um, anyhow, you know, preached. I'd have Phil Kidd in. You know, we became close friends and just a lot of guys. Not to name drop, but just to put it in context. You know, I was I was um, I wasn't a big shot by any means whatsoever, but um, was kind of you know getting in that in that crowd and and preaching for and with a lot of those guys and. Um, <laughs> You know, but but about five years into pastoring, I uh, really started to step back in question. And, and I shared this with Nathan, you know, when we actually met. Nathan and I met over sushi. Yeah. So I met JC and Brian in Vegas. But Nathan, I was passing through going to Georgia on a deer hunt. and, and We met in Chattanooga. Head. Yes, sir. I had some sushi and hung out for three, four hours that night. And I still had to drive the rest of the way down to Madison, Georgia. <laughs> but anyway. Um, hey, Matt. He yeah. He likes sushi with Andrew Sluter better. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever have sushi with Sluter? Yes, I have. What? It didn't compare to Matt Dudley. I'll just have I to don't tell know, you bro. That. Hey, there's I a new know. podcast. Slush, uh, <laughs> there's a new <laughs> There's a new podcast title, Sushi with Sluter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'd be interested to know how that went. We'll we'll talk about that on another episode. Another day, huh? <laughs> All right, so here's here's the story I shared with Nathan that he thought was funny, and I, I think it's a little bit ironic. But some of the stuff that that I learned from from these guys, okay, more the camp meeting crowd, because again, I was in the hype, hyper like bus run, and not that they they run buses too, but I'm saying like it was all about running buses and knocking doors, and 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 really, I came out of a more easy prayer, easy believism type mm -hmm. of crowd, you know, it was all about numbers and pushing the numbers, baptizing homeless people so you can keep your numbers up, you know what I'm saying, like that kind of stuff. And uh, not that homeless people don't need baptized, but, you know, you'd be surprised what they'll do for, you know, if you offer to buy them a Big Mac. But anyway, that was not me, by the way, but that did happen. Um, so as I was getting away from that, like as I'm learning, okay, this there's there's a world outside of this world, right? Uh, you can sing Southern gospel music. You can enjoy bluegrass style music. Uh, you know, uh, even some country, as long as you don't admit it from the pulpit, you know, <laughs> we'd, we'd listen to Skinner and Charlie Daniels riding down the road. Um, it, it really got the wheels spinning because I never was a fan. Let me just throw this out there. I never was a fan of contemporary Christian music, like what I had heard of it up into that point. I, I was not a fan of it. And, uh, you know, of course, in that world, I'd heard so much preaching against it, I rarely even tried to listen. But but, but it started, like, like wearing on me that I thought, you know, if, if it's okay for this church to do their music, you know, very rigid and no sliding and hold your mic this way, and, you know, but then this church over here that believes the same thing uh, can have Southern gospel music. I mean, you know, having different quartets in and... It just, like, you know, I don't know. To me, the logical end of that is, I guess, you know, it's probably okay for other people to worship in ways that maybe doesn't necessarily fit my culture or my preferences. Mm. Um, but if it's not unbiblical, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I wasn't good anymore. Like, I wasn't good with just dismissing these genres or these people or these camps mm -hmm. by saying, well, they're compromisers and they're worldly. I was like, well, what, what does that even mean? Like, let's mm -hmm. define what that means first and foremost. And we can talk more, you know, on the biblical philosophical side of that later. But my point is that really got me like stepping back from everything that I'd been taught. And it was about a five year journey, man. Like I, I went back and started rereading books on, on feminine modesty, you know, uh, started rereading the books that I had to read in college over the King James Bible. I mean, I, I'd read them in college, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to go back now with more of an objective mindset mm -hmm. and I'm going to reread this stuff. Again, I was, I reread Ripplinger stuff, uh, reread like Bill Grady on final authority, just, just went back. I mean, those were like the textbooks on the subject. And, and I just started seeing holes in it, man. Like it didn't, mm -hmm. it didn't make sense to me anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so again, as, as one thing, they would call it a slippery slope, <laughs> but for me, it was just that all this stuff started to unravel. And I was, man, I was, I was walking with God. I was in my Bible. I was in my prayer closet. It wasn't that I was somehow carnal and backslidden and, you know, just trying to get away from God or run from God. It was just coming from a legitimate perspective of wanting to be right scripturally. 
Mm-hmm. And so as I went on that journey, you know, um, like I said, it was about five years. A lot of it to me was number one, I wasn't going to make a quick jump. Like mm-hmm. I, I was not going to, I was not going to be that guy that just, man, all of a sudden I heard a sermon by a Southern Baptist guy that wasn't all that bad. So I'm Southern Baptist now. I just definitely was not going to be that dude that, that jumped from one ship to the other. And so I took it very slowly for that reason. Another reason I took it slow was because I had watched what happened to other guys mm-hmm. that walked away. So, you know, I understood the cost of it. I knew that, you know, you don't leave quietly, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. I tried to leave quietly. Um, I didn't start a podcast, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, I had I had witnessed firsthand the name calling, calling names from the pulpit. I'm pretty sure to this day he told me he was going to. I've never heard it with my own ears, but, <laughs> but one of the preachers I preached for, pastors of a large church, uh, said he was going to get in front of his church and apologize that he ever had me in to preach, which is funny because the last time I preached there we had 18 people trust Christ on a Sunday which, by the way, now one of those people that trusted Christ as a result of that service is my worship leader's wife. They're on staff here at the wow. Ridge awesome. in Dude. Sullivan. They're from the area. They were passing through that particular area on their way to vacation, stopped to hear that guy preach. Turned out I was preaching that day. and uh, So they were, went from disappointed to, you know, she That's prayed awesome. and trusted Christ. Yeah. So anyway, you know, so I knew, I knew what was at stake to a point. Mm. And, uh, and, and truth be told, there was probably a little fear involved, um, on my part because every single friend of mine was IFB, you know, the camps, I, the camp meetings I went to, the camps I preached in, the conferences I preached in, um, again, I could name a lot more names. I'm not naming any names in a negative connotation on purpose, but my point in saying all that is that I just, I knew. So I took, took my time, studied it, you know, was, uh, very introspective, you know, and, and, and trying to make sure my heart was in the right place. Hey, Matt, did it, did it become a matter of conviction for you? Yeah, for sure. So again, you got to understand, I started off, especially on the King James. You guys should talk about the King James issue sometime, (laughs) by the way. (laughs) I don't know what else to say to that. Yeah. Uh, But anyway, but you know, especially on, on that particular subject, um, and, and really even modesty. Cause again, my wife wore dresses the first, gosh, 13 years we were married. Mm. She never wore pants. Um, you know, so on those things, I, I, did, I, I wanted to prove it. Like, cause again, I, man, I, this is kind of where I'd, I'd cast my lot. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I was, I was in there with these guys. And so I felt like, you know, I need to make sure. And so, yeah, it definitely come from a place of conviction because I was trying to, I was trying to be able to get behind those things biblically. And then, of course, when you start unpacking, you know, modesty, it's it's not hard to, to figure out that, um, and again, I won't name this book because I was close with this family, the lady that wrote the book I'm about to reference sang in our wedding, but there's one particular book on feminine modesty that the whole premise of the book is built upon the definition of the Greek word catastole. Uh, where Paul wrote to Timothy that the, let the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and, and sobriety. That whole the whole premise of that book is based off a Greek definition, which is kind of interesting, you know, for more than one reason. Number yeah. one, bless bless God, we don't need Greek. We got a King James Bible, hey, but man. you know, but but I'm saying that whole book is built on that one definition. Well, then, I mean, I own a Strong's Concordance. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I went and looked the word up. You know, look up the word catastole. It doesn't mean long flowing garment, but that's what that whole book is based off of. Yeah. And so, man, just crap like that just kept unraveling for me. And um, I don't know. In some ways, I felt stupid, you know, for just kind of getting sucked into it. And, um, you know, in other ways, I felt ashamed because here I had I'd started a church and pastored it. A, in total, I pastored it for 10 years. Um you know, and I'd led the church that way, man. All the women in our—you couldn't get on the platform of our church uh, as a woman if you didn't have a, a long dress on with, you know, nothing, no skin showing up top. And um, man, I wouldn't let guy—I wouldn't—I wouldn't let a, a guy get on the platform and sing without a tie. Here's how rigid I was about it. We had a teenage—we had a—we had a family in our church, uh, mom and and 
two teenage girls and their son, teenage son, uh, that would sing on occasion. And, uh, and that boy come to church one Sunday night in a polo shirt. I went in my office, grabbed a tie off my tie rack. And I said, put that on. He said, wow. what? I said, you know, the rules, boy, you're supposed to wear a tie on the platform. He's like, I got a polo shirt. I said, then put the freaking thing on with a polo shirt. Wow. You're going to wear a tie on this platform. Wow. And, uh, you know, so that tells you what a nice guy I was. Yeah. And embarrassed the <laughs> fool out of that boy. And he probably still hasn't forgiven me. Sorry, Daniel. But anyway, uh, you know, that's just where I was at. So I, you know, again, I wanted to prove this stuff right because it was, it was in me, man. Baptist born, Baptist bred. When I die, I'll be Baptist dead, you know, all yeah. that stuff. Um, and I just, yeah, that's a long way to come around to your, to your question. I, I, it really did become a matter of conviction where I couldn't in good conscience continue to preach that. And I can tell you to this day, strategically, I picked a Sunday night service and I'd been studying in Ezekiel 22:30. There you go. All right. So I had heard as, as most of you had, <clears throat> dozens of messages, especially youth conferences on Ezekiel twenty two thirty. So I sought for a man among them who would make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. You know, where's the man? Where's the man? Where's the man? Where's the man? You know, we'd all heard sermons of that. Well, so I started backing up. Like I backed up in the chapter and 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 started like, you know, what was the real issue in Ezekiel's day? Well, if you back up in chapter number 22, you'll find that the issue in Ezekiel's day was not that there weren't men standing and it's not that there weren't men making up hedges. They were actually literally making up their own hedges because it, Ezekiel prophesied against them and said, you're saying thus saith the Lord when the Lord has not spoken. And so God's indictment on the prophets in Israel in Ezekiel 22 was that, that they were preaching stuff that God didn't instruct them to preach. Ooh. Mm. Wow. And so I got up on a Sunday night and preached a message out of Ezekiel 22 called A Conspiracy Among the Prophets. And, and you could hear a pin drop in our church, which, again, it was a shouting church. Normally they'd have been, you know, peeling the paint off the walls. But, man. Hold on one second, Matt. So you just said you could hear a pin drop? My dad has a pastor friend yeah. who's so country. He told my dad a little while back, he said, man, that service was so quiet, you could have heard a mouse peeing on a cotton ball. <laughs> I knew there was a dad joke coming somewhere. <laughs> Thanks, Papa. I'll go back to sleep now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I opened up Pandora's box that Sunday night, mm -hmm. and, you know, I said stuff like, you know, man, contempt I can't tell you that contemporary Christian music's out of hell, you know. I can't tell you that the King James Version is the only acceptable English version. Uh, I can't tell you that a woman's a whore for wearing a pair of pants, mm. you know. And I, again, dude, I'm telling you, it was it was radical. Oh, here was another thing I said because because in our church culture, man, I mean, look, I had guys in my church. JC, if you walked in that church and called me by my first name, you might have got your head knocked off. You did not call me Matt. It was, I mean, the very least you could call me was Brother Matt, but it was Pastor. It was Pastor Dudley. Um, and I said that Sunday night, I said, and by the way, y'all, my name is Matt. I'm not, I'm not a priest. I'm not an apostle. You don't have to call, call me by some lofty title. Mm. And anyway, I mean, stuff that now you look back, I, I look back now and I think it's crazy that I even had to say that. Yeah. yeah. I had a lady come up to me, very sincere, uh, lady that was in our church and she goes, I, I just don't know what, how to, how should I address you? I said, call me by my freaking name you know we read in the epistles paul on apostle of jesus christ paul 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 you know we refer to jesus as jesus you know and uh so after that of course the word starts getting out and i had said some stuff at some conferences i preached in again i won't get too descriptive because i don't want to call these guys out so the last sermon i preached in a big conference okay this was a national conference um, I preached a message out of Joshua chapter number one. If uh, Again, if I told you the preachers that were there, there were uh, guys like Keith Gomez, um, man, I can't even think of who. Phil Kidd was in that conference. Um, I can't think of who else was there. But I got up and preached a message out of Joshua chapter one where basically God was telling Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. 
and now I'm talking to you, right? Of course, that's a great paraphrase, but but that was the essence of what he was saying. And and I got up and I preached a message called uh, I said <laughs> preached a message that I stole from uh, good old brother Merle Haggart, <laughs> titled "The Good Times Ain't Over for Good." Woo! And I said, "Men come to pass, methods come to pass." Uh, I forgot what I said. There were three M's. It was alliterated. It was beautiful. Amen. Oh yeah. Um, Men come to pass. Oh, movements come to pass. Men come to pass. Movements come to pass. Methods come to pass. But the word of God stands. Wow. And I said, I'm so tired of hearing about the God of Jack Hiles and the God of Lester Roloff and the God of John R. Rice. God's still alive. Jesus is still on the come throne. On. Yes. And uh, man, so that was the last time I was invited to that conference. <laughs> um, you know, so I had started. I had started say. Oh, by the way, that conference split over an iPad. You can ask Phil Kidd that story. <laughs> wow. Um, but he'll tell you, Phil, uh, so Phil Kidd preached off of an iPad at that conference, and, and the other preachers lost their ever-loving minds Oh yeah, oh, my God. over him preaching off of an iPad. And he and I preached together on, on Tuesday morning. I think it was Tuesday. Maybe it was Wednesday morning of the conference. It was a four-day conference. Regardless, Tuesday or Wednesday, we preached together that morning. He had to leave to go to another meeting, and, uh, and that night, the host pastor got up and preached against preachers preaching off of off of iPads. Oh boy. Oh my gosh. And uh well, so me and Stephanie were driving back to our hotel after the service that night. My phone rang and it was Phil Kidd. And uh he goes, "Hey doc. Glory how to glory to God. How was the service tonight? Was it still on? Was the spirit of God still moving?" And I go, "Yeah, man, it was, you know, it was okay. You know, it was pretty good." And he goes, "Now, nah, brother, you know, I know you. What you know? You, there's something in your voice that ain't right. You know what? But, and of course, in in you know his Phil Kid esque way of saying things, you know he he uh, he goes, what what happened? I said, well, I'll just put it to you this way, man. I said, there's about 15 minutes of preaching against iPads. You got to be freaking kidding me. Hung up the phone, <laughs> called the called the host pastor, called the the evangelist that hosts the meeting, and ripped into them. I think he told the evangelist he'd meet him in the parking lot. And <laughs> I mean, it got it got real ugly real quick. <laughs> but uh anyway, so that's the only camp I've or that's the only conference I've ever seen split over an iPad. But wow. um anyway, so I started kind of like saying stuff. You know, like I'm not trying to say like I was coming out saying you, at their conferences you guys are a bunch of heretics. I wasn't and to be, you know, real frank, I wasn't even to that point yet. You know, I wasn't at the point where I would have said, "Man, you're teaching false doctrine and, you know, this is cultish." I, I wouldn't have said that at that point. I'll say it now. But but then I I wouldn't have I wouldn't have said that it was just that I was seeing this stuff like man uh, movements come and go men come and go methods come and go but the gospel stands Jesus is the same yesterday today Amen. forever Hebrews chapter number one the Bible says God who at sundry times and in diverse manners yeah mm. and that's King James version God who at sundry times and in diverse manners. God in different time periods and in different ways worked in people's lives. It wasn't all the same methods, but it didn't change the truth. It didn't change the message of the gospel. And, you know, so anyway, I was just seeing all that stuff. And so started pulling our church out of it, right? Like, uh, yeah. of course, that, that one night was kind of, you know, kind of the atom bomb. But for the most part, you know, it, it seemed uh, like the people were a little bit relieved in some ways to hear some of that stuff. Um, and, and of course they had questions. And so I spent more time going through, you know, in more detail and teaching things. And, and, and again, for the most part, they really seemed to follow me. You know what I'm saying? Um, I still preached out of the King James version. You know, I, for the most part would still wear suits, um, in the pulpit, uh, you know, so so they they followed me out of that. But I, I guess the best way to put it about the church, at least, is that um, y you know you can you can teach them about legalism, but to actually get the legalism out of their heart, uh, because there's a spirit there, man. And I'm not being like yeah. you know superstitious, yeah. but but there's a there's a there's a spirit to that. You know that mindset. Sure. And I've learned now, of course, you know hindsight's twenty twenty. But I've learned now that that transcends denominations. That's not just an independent Baptist thing in our church. Right. We've seen people freed from from legalism, from Pentecostal movements, and and different types of backgrounds. Legalism knows no boundaries, but You're right. but that same spirit was present, you know. And so it started kind of bubbling up, 
in different ways in the church. Let me ask you this: what did you what did you see change quickly, and what took time to get figured out as far as change wise? As far as make, as far as changing preaching style, not wearing a suit, uh, music, you know, ladies wearing pants in the church. What to get from where y'all were at to where you're at today? What was the what was the pattern like? Well, that's where the story gets gets a little rougher. I mean, you know, I could say uh, there were things, there were certain things that were harder to let go of. You know, um, mm -hmm. man, I didn't preach out of a different version for I couldn't tell you how long. You know, mm -hmm. um, I would read. I mean, the first version of the Bible I read, other than a King James version, was I read the ESV from cover to cover, um, <clears throat> and didn't see any great blasphemy or heresy there. Um, but, but I still would preach from the King James version. So, I mean, that was, that was kind of hard to let go of. Um, you know, when my wife first started wearing pants, obviously that was a, a little different cause I'd never seen her in pants before. And, and again, you know, these guys will, oh yeah, you just jumped out and started changing everything. We did not, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, but when that, when that, when that preference became, you know, really, materialized for what it was that this is a preference this is not unbiblical you know um and she she actually started wearing pants i got i started getting phone calls from preachers in other states i got a phone call from one guy i won't even name the state but i got a call from a guy and said brother i heard your wife's wearing pants and i said brother don't worry about what my wife's wearing <laughs> and um and again i won't name the specific scandal that he was involved in, but trust me, during the same time he was worried about my wife wearing britches, he was doing something much more heinous. Wow! Um, and um, that later came out, and he was dismissed from his church because of it. But um, you know, so here he's living in just gross sin in his private life, and uh, and he's worried about my wife, you know, being in her britches. Yeah. And I thought, dude, come on, man. But uh, yeah, you know, some some habits die hard. My preaching style has definitely changed. Yeah. How long did that take? Well, you know, so I'm I'm creeping up on the segment of where I, you know, where I kind of start started to unravel. And this is where right. my story gets ugly. So, you know, you guys had you just had Hunter Strength on your podcast uh, a little bit a little while ago, four or five weeks ago. And hearing his story, I thought, man, that that guy, he did it right. Like he left. Yeah. He's left the right way. He's got a good head on his shoulders. I did everything wrong from this point forward. So one thing I've always had a problem with is uh, I've got a bad temper, and uh, and and I've struggled all throughout my life, off and on, with depression um, and things like that. Which, if you study that, you know, often people who are depressed also have kind of you know a temper and anger problem. And so what started happening, again, obviously I knew walking into this that I was going to be, you know, railroaded. I was going to lose lose all my so-called friends. Um, some of them never called. Some of them called and criticized me. Some of them called, put me on speakerphone with other preachers and asked me questions when I didn't know I was being questioned in front of other preachers. Which I don't I don't care. I might have cussed a little bit, but <laughs> I don't care. You know, I didn't have anything to say that I, that I cared that they listened to. But it's just, you know, that's that's dishonest to call a guy and put him on speakerphone with a room full yeah. of preachers. But, you know, so I knew that was coming, but, but actually going through it, I, I just really wasn't prepared for. And so, uh, I mean, you can go, I shared my story. Of course you shared that little 10 minute clip. I actually shared this whole story in detail at our church here, uh, last August. There's like an hour long audio on YouTube, uh, called this is my story part two. I kind of built off of that, that, that bumper video. Um, but I started just getting real bitter. I started getting angry. Um, I started turning the fight, you know, inward and man, I was fussing with these guys. I was arguing with them over the phone and, you know, I should have just left it alone. Just been like, you know, what? <laughs> you know, you're the man, you know, whatever, what, what's good with you is fine. But I didn't. And, uh, argued with them, man, I, I had an evangelist out of our church that left, you know, for that very reason, cause I wasn't King James only, uh, my assistant left, you know, anyway, it was just, it, it, my assistant at the time was, was one of my very best friends in the world. And, um, and he left and, you know, I don't fault him cause he's, he was younger. I hired him right out of Bible college and it was a lot for him to take in. So I don't hold that against him now, but at the time, man, I was, 
I was mad and uh, didn't have a friend in the world. Um, kind of started, you know, like running with some SBC guys. No offense, Brian, but started running with some SBC guys. And I, I felt like I saw just a different form of legalism. In the, and I'm not saying the whole SBC is that way at all. In fact, our church, we support the cooperative program as part of our missions portfolio. So I'm not anti-SBC, but but I saw a lot of that same stuff I felt in the SBC with just a little bit of a different different T-shirt on maybe. Um, and so, you know, I kind of got to this point where I was like, you know, this is all a bunch of bull. You know, these guys are, you know, they're all fakes and they're all turncoats and they're all, you know, they'll all stab you in the back and... I mean, I really started having a real, real good pity party. And um, we were facing some personal tragedies. And again, I shared part of this in that in that little video. But um, we had some stuff come into our personal lives. Man, we've got, I didn't even introduce my family. Golly, y'all were supposed to ask me about my family at the front part of the podcast. Y'all need to get with the program, dude. <laughs> I know it. I know it. So I've got a wife. and We'll the... figure this podcasting thing <laughs> out someday. Yeah, I promise. You're, you're noobs. It's okay. <laughs> So married to my beautiful wife of almost 20 years, coming up on 19 years this July 19th. Um, we have five boys, David, Philip, Joseph, Tatum, and Jensen, ranging in age from three years old to almost 17. Wow. wow and cool. so, uh, yeah, our life's crazy. I raise, I'm raising some pigs and a cow, so I'm a big-time farmer. Nice. But, um, <laughs> yeah, coming back to where we were at in the story, so – Stephanie and I started, you know, we had some, of course, the struggle coming out of the IFB was rough. We all but really one preacher friend of mine abandoned, you know, wouldn't even talk to me. Um, and so felt very lonely. Like I said, some of that stuff started cropping up in the church too. Like, so um, I remember saying one time uh, in a sermon, and again, I was still preaching in this, you know, very loud, forceful, hard you know, method of preaching. But I remember saying one time, I said, you know, it's amazing to me how, how quick you are to listen to legalism, but grace just falls on deaf ears around here. You know, I, I remember, I remember feeling like, man, now I'm trying to preach what the Bible actually says versus, you know, some of these other traditional things that, that were preached and taught. And, uh, it just felt like all that wasn't resonating and it, and it, man, it just literally, and I know this wouldn't have been the right thing to do, but I have looked back on, on this situation and thought, I probably should have just resigned that church, walked away quietly, and and never, you know, having never tried to lead them out of that. I know that's not the right thing to do, but it would have been a heck of a lot easier yeah. to just yeah. cut ties, walk away, and then land somewhere else. But you know, so so that became a major struggle, man. We tried to launch another church in a in a bigger town. So when I say I pastored in this area for ten years, man, I mean I'm talking about I was in an area all there was was a post office and one BP gas station and of course a bar. But I mean there was nothing out there, like two thousand people. You know, the church ran about a hundred and twenty five high days of two hundred. Um, you know, so everybody was real tight. We were real close knit family. And, um, I don't know, it just, everything seemed to start unraveling. And then again, in our personal lives, um, at the time we had three sons and, um, you know, Stephanie, Stephanie got in the motherly way again and she got pregnant and, um, <laughs> man, you know, we just knew, man, this is going to be our, our little girl. And, uh, you know, so I forgot how far along she was. She could tell you all these timelines and details, and she'll probably correct me later on some of my, my timelines here. But, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, but she wound up, she wound up losing the baby in a very tragic way. Um, went in for a checkup because some stuff was not feeling right. You know, she was having some pain, and she we'd miscarried two times prior to that. And, uh, so she went in and wound up in the doctor's office, you know, going into a, a sort of labor and got rushed back. I mean, it was just a real crazy situation. Again, I mean, all this is happening in the midst of, of all these other things going on. And, um, we, of course lost the baby. Um, my cousin was the attending nurse in the OR when that happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she later called me and she said, um, she asked me, she said, do you want to know what, what the baby, what kind of, what sex the baby was? And I said, I said, yeah, I'd like to know. And she said, well, it was a little girl. And I mean, we'd already picked out names and, you know, we're going to name her Eliana. And I mean, we, you know, so I don't know. And again, I am, I take the full blame for what I'm about to say to you, but 
I got, I started like getting real bitter at God in that season. And, and just in my heart, I thought, you know, um, really? I mean, all I, we just want to be good parents. We just want to have a little girl, you know, um, and, and, and that's too much to ask. You know, I got, I started getting real cynical and, um, man, I never forget Stephanie was still in the hospital and my elderly mother at the time lived with us. And, and I went home to get a change of clothes to go back to the hospital and, and grab Steph some clothes. And, and, uh, I hadn't cried. I hadn't shown any emotion. And, and, and my mom walked up to me and, and didn't even say a word, gave me a hug. And I just melted and started weeping in her arms. And, and I was falling apart. You know, I was, I was coming apart at the seams. Um, so much so that, that one preacher that I counseled with again at the time, I had a, a great deal of confidence in him and, and I counseled with him and he said, brother, I think you need to get on some antidepressants. And so I talked to my doctor about it. My doctor started feeding me antidepressants, feeding me anti-anxiety medicine. Um, I was, I had injured my back, uh, several times, but the most recent at, at that time, uh, I had, i threw my back out real bad, you know, lifting weights. And, um, so my doctor put me on muscle relaxers and pain pills. And, um, and so during that season, it's not a good thing to give a guy that's not real stable psychologically and emotionally. And, um, man, I started, I started eating pain pills like candy. And uh, again, I'm not proud of this. I don't glory in it. Um, but, but for me, because I, I wasn't in a good place mentally and, and spiritually, uh, you know, cause I, I started getting my bitterness toward people started t- turning toward God yeah. and I got real bitter at God, man. I started, I started questioning everything. Um, it was coming out in my preaching. I mean, I was, I was preaching mean, you know, just saying harsh things. And, um, I, I, you know, I had now, I didn't realize it then, but now looking back, I had a complete psychological breakdown. I'm ashamed to say that. We all like to, you know, think we've got it put together all the time, but, but I had a complete psychological breakdown. I guess some would diagnose that a, you know, uh, nervous breakdown. Um, but as I shared in that, in that video, um, I, I, I was ready to end it. I was mad at God. I was mad at the world. I was mad at the church. I was mad at everybody and anything, you know, that was good in my life. I was pushing away. And, uh, and again, I had struggled now. I want, I want to clarify this. Even throughout my ministry, I'd struggled with suicidal thoughts. Um, that was taboo in the independent Baptist world. As a matter of fact, when I was 26, 27 years old, I remember going through a deep season of depression and um i called a preacher that i i looked up to i mean practically idolized this guy at the time i called him and i shared some of this stuff i was so depressed and i was so suicidal that my wife said you need to call and she called his name she said you need to call and talk to him and uh didn't want to but i did you know i sucked it up called the guy i didn't want to admit that i was depressed i didn't want to admit that i was suicidal but I did it. I called this guy and I, I shared my heart with him. I said, man, I, I, I'm I not going to do anything. I'm not going to harm myself. But for some reason, man, I got these nagging thoughts, these destructive thoughts, just end it, just end it. I mean, just over and over, you know, I was fighting this battle in my mind. And of course he talked me through it over the phone. But like I said, back in those days, if you wanted to listen to a guy preach, you had to go to their website. So that next, after that following Sunday, uh, on Monday, I would go to to preachers' website, their church websites, and listen to their sermons from Sunday. I went and listened to that dude's sermon from from the day before, and uh, and he gets up in his pulpit and he says, "Yeah, I had this young preacher call me this past week and talking about he wants to kill himself. God help you! Ain't gonna kill yourself, son. Whoever told you the ministry's easy?" And he gets up in his pulpit and is talking about me. Now he did not name my name, but I knew who he was talking about. Hmm. And, and he, and so, man, I was like, what, you know? So from there, I just kind of shut down. I was like, I ain't telling another son of a gun, you know, what I'm dealing with until it was too late, you know? And Brian, I shared with you, I had come across your dad, uh, well, your dad on Facebook actually talking about his book on depression. And I messaged Mm -hmm. him over Facebook messenger and we talked back and forth a little bit about depression and, um, I never did buy the book. I probably should have, but <laughs> you know, but it was refreshing to me to hear another preacher being transparent about the fact that, that he struggled with yeah. depression. So fast forward, 
I'm in my early thirties, early to mid thirties. Um, again, my wife can straighten out the timelines, but, uh, yeah, I'd have had to been like 30, 32, 33. Um, and I, I was just ready to end it, man. And I was so discouraged, so depressed, just so done with people, so done with God. And I'm ashamed to say that, but, um, you know, I went and sat and was going to follow through. I had planned in my head how I was going to end it. I parked my truck at the top of a boat ramp, put my truck in drive, held my foot on the brake, put a 40 cal under my chin. And, and I wasn't playing games. I didn't write a suicide note. I didn't tell anybody I was suicidal. I just was going to do it. And, um, sitting there with my finger on a, on the trigger about to pull the trigger. I'm not one for visions and dreams. Never had anything like this happen before, but in that moment, I visibly in my in my mind could see my kids walking by my casket weeping mm. and and mm. I began to weep and I began to shake and I threw my gun down in the pasture seat of the truck and f- don't know how how long I sat there but I just I just broke and cried and and I'd love to tell you that that I cried in a place of repentance and submission but I really didn't it was just it was just more of of a hurt and a pain and all that all that mess just coming out and, um, you know, shortly after that, I knew I wasn't in a good place. Um, I, I'm not criticizing anybody for taking antidepressants, but those things were screwing my head up, yeah. obviously mixing it with anti-anxiety. I was taking Xanax. I was taking painkillers at the same time, all of it prescribed. I didn't buy street drugs, not that it makes it any better, but I was everything that, that I was taking. I was being prescribed by my doctor. Um, in fact, one, at one point, my doctor had me on. Um, let me say this right. I was prescribed three 15 milligram oxycodones. No, I was prescribed six 15 milligram oxycodones per day. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, how that guy hasn't lost his license, I'll never know. But, um, so I was, I was just taking what I was being prescribed, but it had me in a stupor. Anyway, I wound up resigning the church. I'd really just had enough. And, uh, again, we were like a close family, but I, I pushed everybody away resigned the church. When I resigned, I went to an even darker place because here I was in my early thirties. All I ever want to do is preach. All I ever want to do is be in the ministry. And now I'm looking around me and everything. And again, I'd love to say that leaving fundamentalism was, was, was a good thing for me at the time. It was definitely a good thing, but the way I handled the, the backlash of it was, was not good. And, uh, uh, man, I, I I walked away from the church, and when I did that, I didn't just resign the church; I resigned God. And mm. if you could lose your salvation, I'd have lost it because I said I said I'm done. And I took my old black King James Bible and I I slammed it down. I said I'll never preach that again. I didn't I didn't even know what I believed at that point. My mind was so messed up. I went back to work in the in the I had done construction remodeling design and sales before. Went right back, got rehired at the same company I used to work for. And man, I was working, I was making good money, but I was miserable inside. Um, I wasn't praying. I wasn't reading my Bible. We were going to church. We started going to a Southern Baptist church that was close to our house. Uh, and really the only reason we started going there was because they ran about a thousand people and I knew I could just slip in and slip out unrecognized. And, um, you know, but I was going completely out, out of a place of, you know, just because I knew I was supposed to. You know, Matt, I think what you just shared really resonates with a lot of people um, in our RFP family, those that are listening. Um, I think even some pastors, some ministry leaders, some folks that have left the IFB or are still in that uh, are afraid to say they're feeling like you were feeling um, at that point. And if I could just talk to my ministry friends, to our listeners, to you who wouldn't consider yourself a recovering fundamentalist. You are, um, you feel stuck. You feel like you're in a place that you, there is no hope. Um, I know there's a stigma that makes us afraid to reach out for help. We get that. I think all three of, all four of us on this podcast understand that, but something's got to change. Um, we're, I'm so over losing friends to suicide, uh, to hearing pastors that are struggling with this epidemic of just no hope of being stuck and feeling like they can't get out and there's no freedom from that. Listen, suicide doesn't discriminate. Mm. It can happen to anyone, anytime, anywhere. And we have got to not be afraid to ask for help. You have worth, you have purpose. 
life is worth living. And listen, friends, if you're listening right now, tomorrow needs you. Tomorrow needs you. I, the struggles that's going on, I hope you hear Matt's story and just the hurt that was in that uh, in that moment. And, and it is such a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Yeah. And uh, I want you to know, I just feel like we need to just let you know right now, hey, we're here for you. Um, the RFP fam is mm-hmm. here. Um, there's hotlines that you can call. Um, if you're listening to this right now, if this is the first time out or this is 10 years from now and you come across this podcast and you you hear this, we want you to know that there is hope. Your current circumstance is not the end. Yeah. If that's a decision that you've made that's put you in this circumstance, if that's a decision made by somebody else that's put you there, there is hope. The yeah. sun is going to come up tomorrow. And and I really want to encourage you to reach out. Some of you pastors that are listening to this, maybe you're still stuck in the IFB and you feel exactly like Dudley felt and you just don't feel like there's anybody that gets you. Listen, you're not alone. Yeah. There's a lot of daggum people that know exactly what you're feeling. And I hope that this is just an encouragement to you to to reach out, to find some help, to – man, don't make a stupid decision. Yeah. JC, I'm really glad you shared that. And, uh, you know, Matt, your story is so much like mine mm. with all of the rejection and the bitterness and the anger and – and when I came out of fundamentalism not having anybody, and I've been very open about the fact that I believe I, too, had a nervous breakdown. Mm-hmm. And when you feel so isolated and angry mm-hmm. and you feel like God's forsaken you and the people that you had confidence in have forsaken you, you can really get in a dark, dark place. Yeah. But I know your story didn't end there. You didn't stay in that dark place. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and I want to clarify this because I know I know what the cynics and critics will say. I am not saying that I had a nervous breakdown because of the independent Baptist movement. Sure. You know, I wish, sure. I mean, if I could turn back the hands of time, I would have handled that so different, you know. Um I mean, I I got in big big arguments with again some big name preachers that I could call their names. Um and again, I wish I'd have just left it alone. You know, I wasn't going to change them. They weren't going to change me. So I, I, all I'm trying to clarify is I'm not in any way saying, man, the IFB drove me to a nervous breakdown. I will say that, that the, that the brotherhood, you know, the fraternity mindset that is definitely present in the IFB. And we can unpack yeah. more of that. Um, yeah. I had one guy, I called him out on it. I said, you guys, I said, all you are is a big, big freaking fraternity. Oh, there's no such thing as a fraternity. I said, bull crap, you guys, because they'd use that same language with me. They said, they said, I had one of them look across the table from me one time, and he goes, brother, you're part of the fraternity now. And I was like, what? what's even, I don't know what the fraternity is. But now I know, yeah. now I know, and when you turn on the fraternity, buddy, they will turn on you. So I'm, look, I, credit where credit's due, you know, I, I do blame, you know, the whole, the whole monstrosity of of a lot of what goes on in that movement, but I don't blame them for the way I responded to it. You know, sure. they didn't put they didn't put pain pills in my mouth. They, you know, um, and, and again, I'm I'm morbidly ashamed of this to this day. I I hate the fact that I did that, but I was going literally so insane at the time. The only thing that would calm my brain was was to take a an oxycodone. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it would call, and uh, antidepressants didn't do it, and anxiety didn't do it. Um, and uh, but obviously that made things worse. And so I don't blame them in any way, shape, or form for how I responded to that. And that probably shouldn't need to be said, but y'all well know it needs to be said. So I resigned resigned my church. Again, it it felt like my whole world had come unraveled. I didn't I didn't have any friends and man I didn't fit in in the world and here's here was the here was the mind jack okay of the whole thing because I was looking whether I was seeing it the right way or not but but I was looking at all my my IFB preacher buddies I was looking at my staff that had left I was looking at you know all these people that had that had turned their back on me and I couldn't get away and by the way at the time I pastored about an hour from here which is my hometown Sullivan Missouri um, but I couldn't get it out of my head that, man, I got, I've got old buddies that I used to run with 20 years ago that I could call them right now and they'd be shoulder to shoulder with me in a dog fight if I needed them. 
And that and, and and I'm I'm thinking, man, these guys are lost. They don't know Jesus. They don't believe the Bible. But mm-hmm. if I called them up in a pinch, they'd be right there. And mm. you know what I did? I called a couple of them up. Said, man, hadn't talked to you in a long time. Let's let's go hang out. And I did. I started hanging out with some of my old buddies again. And, uh, you know, it was just, I didn't know where to go, didn't know what to do. Um, and so, you know, there was a, there was about a four month period of my life after, you know, going through the portion of my story that I just shared, you know, I resigned the church. There were, there was a four month period of my life where, um, I was just, I was gone. Like I was there, but I wasn't there. I was doing my job. I was, you know, reaching the top of the charts in my in my in my company, you know, within four months. But, but I'm talking. I just was. I was definitely not right with God. My heart wasn't right with God. I wasn't touching my Bible. I wasn't praying, um, which I hadn't done that in 18 years. Again, if I have my numbers straight in my head, 16, 17 years maybe at the time, I hadn't gone a day without being in the Bible. And, and I threw it down and, and, and to be again, just completely transparent, I was starting to question stuff. I was starting to question the validity of, of promises that didn't seem real to me. Cause I thought, where are you at now? You know, yeah. where are you at in my life now? I thought we were more than conquerors. You know, I thought greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And all I've done, Nathan, talking about, you asked me earlier if I made those decisions out of conviction. 100% I made those decisions out of conviction. And then so now I'm I'm looking back going, really? You know, so all I was trying to do was, was be right with God. All I was trying to do was preach the Bible the way it's supposed to be preached and taught. And, and this is what I get. And again, those thoughts are false. I know where they come from. That's the lie of the devil. But, man, I was buying in. And so for about four months, I was I was just gone, eating pain pills like candy. You know, um, I didn't think I was addicted to them. Oddly enough, in hindsight, you know, I'd I'd done all kinds of crazy street drugs when I was lost, and so taking a pain pill is like popping a Tylenol in my book. Um, <laughs> but you know, but it became abundantly clear um, that I was that I was physically addicted to to painkillers, and so. Um, I took my wife with me when you're obviously, if you've ever been on opioids for any length of time, you know, that you have to go see your doctor every single month. And so, uh, the next time I was supposed to go see my doctor, I I took my wife with me and I said, babe, I'm, I'm getting off of these things. I'm done with this. I don't like the person that I become. I became very, very distant, very unemotional, which I'm an emotional guy, a very expressive guy, man. I just got real flat real cold and indifferent. And I said, I don't like the guy that I don't like the person that I am. So Stephanie went with me to my doctor's appointment. Of course he comes in and all he's looking to do is write you another script, you know, but you know, how's your pain? How's this? You know, how on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your pain? Which normally I would say, ah, you know, doc, it's kind of, <laughs> you know, I can still feel it. You know, it's probably a seven or an eight. And then of course he'd up the prescription. Um, but this time, man, I started just crying sitting in that doctor's office and, I started to weep and I said, Doc, I said, I want off of these things. I had tried to come off of them on my own. I tried to quit just cold turkey and, and got sick as a dog. And uh, I said, man, you got to get me off of these things. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm weeping. And, and uh, he said, well, what are you going to do for your back pain? I said, I'll take a freaking Tylenol. I don't know, but get me off these pain pills, whatever you got to do. If you can give me some, you know what I'm saying? Like, is there a prescription to get off the prescription type of thing? Which there's not. He he prescribed me Suboxone. That was a hundred times worse in my book than than mm-hmm. the opioids. So I did still wind up quitting cold turkey. I just shut myself up in in our bedroom and I said, "Don't let the kids come in till I come out." And uh, I got sick, sick, sick for about mm. four days. And um, but by the grace of God, I beat it. I got my heart right with God, you know. But I, I you know, and, and again, I'm not going to try to go through all the psychological stuff that goes on. But you know, when when you take opioids, your body releases certain chemicals, you know. And it, what do they call that? You probably know the terminology, dopamine. Brian. You're smarter than I am. Dopamine, but there's another one. Matt, I think what you're talking about is endorphins. Endorphins. Thank it you. Releases endorphins yes. into your body. Thank you, Doctor Edwards. Honorary Doctor Edwards. It releases. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, I Sorry. keep that in the drawer, by the way. <laughs> I can pick at guys who have honorary doctorates and use those because I actually have one. I'll be honest. Brian blew my mind this week. He called me and we were talking. He goes, you know I have an honorary doctorate. And I was like, oh, my gosh, how did I not know that? Uh, you are you are forevermore Dr. Edwards to me. Doc, That's exactly right, Dr. Yeah. Brian. 
Uh, no, thank you. But, uh, anyway, Dr. Edwards, yes. So it was, you know, so my all my body chemistry was jacked up, you know, because you're used to having this this release of endorphins and, you know, the feel-good chemicals in your body. So, again, I started, I kind of slid back into a place of not, not as deep depression because at this point I, I had started going, like, actually paying attention in church. I never I completely stopped going to church, but, um, you know, I was starting to, pay attention and by the way man so get this tell me this ain't just like god so we start going to a southern baptist church everything about this church like went against the grain of my personality like the music i i hated it i was like what is this lame you know 711 you know what i'm saying like i was okay with contemporary music but they did a lot of the just very repetitive. I hated it. Like, um, but again, I was going there cause it was a big church. Nobody knew me. I would, we would slip in as a family, sit, sit beneath the, the, under the mezzanine and man, come in late, leave early, you know, just flying under the radar. Well, shortly after we started going there and this is like completely, you know, just random, but I think it's worth telling shortly after we started going there, the pastor, Roger Johnson's his name, uh, pastor Roger started preaching a series on Jonah. Mm. And man, he introduced that series on on Sunday morning, and in my head, I thought, "Well, here we go." You know, <laughs> I know where this is going. We get in we get in the car to go home, and uh, Stephanie goes like, "It's real quiet." And Steph goes, "You know, isn't it funny that he started that series on Jonah?" I was like, "Babe, stop! Seriously, just don't. I don't want to hear it." And uh, so, but but here here is how. This is just how God was working in my heart at the time. You have to understand my mindset. So I had been ingrained that if you walk away, God's going to judge you. You're you're going to get in a car accident, break your back. You're going to be paralyzed. Yep. Your kid's going to get cancer. They're going to die an uh, untimely death. So all this time now, now a normal person would be in a place of fear. I was mad about it, you know, because here I'm waiting on the hammer to fall. And I'm and and literally and again I'm ashamed of this, but literally there were times that I I would look up and go, okay, what's what's coming? You know, what are you gonna do, God? Because I know the judgment's coming, right? Because because we know that God is up in heaven waiting for us to step out of line so He can browbeat us. Um, but and that's what I expected. And then of course when He started that series, I was like, okay, you know, preacher running from God. I get it. Here we go, man. He took the story of Jonah and preached the grace of God. Wow. In a way that I had never heard it preached. And all the while, I'm waiting on the hammer to fall. And I'm waiting on this preacher, you know, to get up. And he's he's more of a talker, more of a, you know, an illustrator type of a preacher. You know, I was just waiting for him to, to start shucking the corn and go into his hacking southern preaching voice. And bless God, you're running from God. You know, I was waiting on that. But it never, it never happened. And he preached grace, man. And God was just wrecking me. I got so convicted every time I'd walk in that church, that mm. same contemporary music that drove me nuts. I couldn't even sit through a worship service. I'd have to get up. I'd be crying so hard. I'd have to get up from that mezzanine wow. and walk out. And, and here's another God moment for me. One Sunday, about two songs in, I'm sitting there just bawling like a baby. I said, babe, I'm going to slip off to the bathroom. Church running a thousand people, nobody knows me. It's Southern Baptist. I wasn't known in the Southern Baptist world. Church that nobody knows me. I slip off into and, and I go in the men's bathroom, man. I'm trying to kind of clean. I'm an ugly crier, so I'm blotchy and snots running out of my nose. Lo and behold, this guy that my dad back in the eighties sang Southern Gospel with goes to that church. His name's David Davis. Dave Davis walked in that church bathroom with me in there bawling. He's like, hey, brother, Matt, I ain't seen you in years. I was like, no, you know, and um, yeah, it was, it was just, it was just crazy. So, you know, through this process, you know, I'm trying to get my life straightened back out. And, um, you know, I got to this point and again, you quantify this however you want to, whether it was, whether it was psychological, chemical imbalance or whatever. I'd never had insomnia ever in my life. In fact, I'm the other type of person. I sit down for 15 minutes, try to watch something. I fall asleep. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I got insomnia where like once a week I couldn't sleep at all through the whole night. And, and, you know, so instead of sitting up watching TV or doing something like that, I'd get up and slip off into our garage. So I wouldn't be shuffling around the house and wake the babies up. And, uh, so that became a habit. Like once a week, all night long, I would, I would be up and, and not get a wink of sleep. Well, this one particular night, 
I couldn't sleep, so I got up out of bed, went out in the garage, and I had started taking my four-wheeler apart. I don't really know why, but it was just something to do. I was pulling all the plastics off of it, and I don't know what I thought I was going to do. I'm not a mechanic. The opposite, whatever the opposite of mechanic is, that's what I am. <laughs> but uh, I tore the, I tore my four-wheeler in pieces, and uh, you know I had turned on 99.1 Joy FM, which is a St. Louis you know contemporary Christian radio station, and I just kind of put it on in the background for some just noise to, you know, kind of drown out my own thoughts. And, uh, that night as I was, I was sitting in the garage floor, you know, piddling with my four wheeler, couldn't sleep, you know, um, a song came on the radio that that's obviously very well known. It wasn't to me at the time, but it's the song, tell your heart to beat again by Danny Gokey. Mm. And, where I was at in my in my mindset at the time, I felt like I had wrecked my life. And my wife would share this part of the story with you. She came home, her and the kids come home one day, and I had come home from work early. And I was sitting in the living room staring at a picture of my family on the wall just weeping. Now, this is beyond the nervous breakdown. This is beyond the pain pills. This is beyond – I wasn't on, on anything at the time. Um, and, and I was just weeping because I, every time I looked at a picture of my family, it reminded me what a, what a screw up I was. And I felt like I'd wrecked their lives. My, my kids had never known anything but a preacher for a dad. And now, you know, I'm sitting in the back of a church, not even serving in the church, you know, and I just felt like a complete utter failure. And so as I'm sitting on the floor that night in my garage, my four wheeler in pieces all over the place, the first line of that song says shattered like you've never been before the life you knew in a thousand pieces on the floor and words fall short in times like these when this world drives you to your knees you think you're never going to get back to the you that used to be but tell your heart to beat again close your eyes and breathe man that song hit me like an anvil i rolled from my backside onto my knees and began to weep it felt like every single word of that song was written for me mm. and 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 in that moment as i'm weeping and praying and you know just crying out to god and he's singing in the background tell your heart to beat again i felt just that god just put a fresh breath of air in my lungs and and i started praying like this and i remember so distinctively because this has now become a theme of my life but but i started praying saying god i just i want to get back i want to get back i want to i want to be the the man i used to be i want to be the preacher that i used to be i want to get back there and the spirit of god stopped me and god said son i didn't bring you out to bring you right back to where you were mm -hmm. yeah and in my heart i'd preached the text couldn't tell you how many times jeremiah chapter number 18 God brought up that passage in my mind and in my heart, and in and and, and, and the verse 18, verse number 4, it says, The vessel that was made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel. Mm. And, and God in that time said, I'm not trying to bring, I don't want you back to where you were. I don't wow. want the same preacher. I don't want the mm. same husband. I don't want the same dad. And... I surrendered afresh and anew in, in my heart that night to God. I, I surrendered to do anything. I never thought I'd go back in the ministry, man. A guy that threw his Bible down and said, I'll never preach that again, I just didn't think God would use me. <laughs> I didn't think God would use a, a preacher that got hooked on pills. I didn't think God would use a preacher that was living the way I was living for that four-month period of time. Man, I wanted nothing to do with God. And I, I legitimately thought God would never use me again. Mm. Um. But Roger Johnson, that same this pastor of the church we were going to, um, I, I left a message that I wouldn't fill out a visitor's card at that church. That's where my mind was at the time. I was like, I ain't filling out a daggum visitor's card. I ain't going to have them come bu bug me. Well, son, the next Sunday I filled out, a, I don't know if it was the next Sunday, but sometime in that, in that time period I filled out a visitor's card and I checked the box. I said, I want a visit from the pastor. Well, that Sunday afternoon, one of the associate pastors called me and introduced himself on the phone. I said, what did you say your name is again? And he told me his name. I said, I didn't say I want to talk to you. I said, I want to talk to the senior pastor. So tell, tell Brother Roger, tell the pastor I want to talk to him. So uh, Pastor Roger set up a time to come to our house. And, and, man, I just unloaded on him, you know, like 
I told him every ugly little thing about everything I'd done, and and I told him what a wicked preacher I was and how you know wrong I was for running from God. And and I sat there, man, for like 15 minutes. He sat in our living room. My wife sat on my left side. He sat on the on the couch, you know, adjacent to me, uh, to my right. And I mean, I just I didn't even look at him. I just kept going on, man, telling him what a bad preacher I was and and what a bad Christian I was. And I was waiting again, you know, I was waiting on him to tell me what a sorry son of a gun. You'll never, yeah, yeah God, will, God will never use you again, boy. Just get used to that job. And, you know, which I actually loved my job. That wasn't a problem. But, you know, I was waiting on that hammer to fall. So I wouldn't even make eye contact with him. So I said all my peace. And as soon as I got done talking, I looked up at him waiting for his response. And he had tears streaming down both of his cheeks. And he said, he said, God's not done with you. Mm-hmm. He said, from the time I first met you, I knew the hand of God was on you. And he said, God will use you again. Mm. And that statement, as simple as it is, just just breathed life into me. So I started leading worship there. Uh, they were without a worship leader at the time. And so I started, I started helping on the worship team and helping lead worship. And um, very, 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 very long story short, um, several months later, we started a little Bible study here in Sullivan. And, um, man, people just started coming out in droves. And now we're in our, well, technically we're in our third building. We've outgrown this building and we're looking for another one. Um, but God's just completely, God's completely shifted my ministry. Um, we reach, you know, I I don't know who said this. I'd, I'd love to be the guy that coined this phrase, but I heard a preacher say one time, he said, if you'll preach to the broken, you'll never lack a crowd. Wow. And we've just done that. I just we just preach to the broken, and I mean we reach every every kind, <laughs> every kind. When I shared my testimony, I shared my testimony in two parts last August. I shared the first part about how I got saved, and uh, man, we had people here strung out on meth. We had people coming down off of heroin. You know, um, it was crazy. Standing room only. Um, but uh, I mean, we reach every 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 group of people from drug addicts to people that are recovering fundamentalists. We got a lot of recovering fundamentalists in our church, by the way. Um, And I found that freedom in Christ is the same for both. Yeah. Really. Matt, you just made a statement about feeling like God would never use you again, and it just reminded me. This past week, guys, I heard this phrase in a song, and and you talk about just gripping your heart. Um, The phrase said, you can't let God down because you were never holding God up. (laughs) It's true. And so often we think we've let God down, but if we believe in the sovereignty of God, he knows everything we're going to do, and he saves us anyway. Hmm. He knows every mistake we're going to make, every sin we're going to commit, and he saves us anyway. Um, A little while back I, I just told the church, I love the anyway love of God because he loves us anyway. Right. And, you know, I shared that part about, and we know chastisement's in the Bible. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't deny that. But I learned something about the chastisement of God. And trust me, God dealt with me mm-hmm. through that whole season. But but it was, it was, in, it was in the, the last way I thought God would ever chastise me. He chastised me with his love. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I'm telling you, that wrecked me. God's grace wrecked me because I was, I was combative. Like, like I was going into fight mode, like, okay, God, you know, and I know that sounds stupid. It it sounds stupid even coming out of my mouth, but literally the place I, where I was at mentally at the time, I was just mad and, 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 and mad at the fact that because I, you know, resigned the church and, you know, whatever I, I was expecting, you know, got hooked on pain pills. I was expecting, you know, the worst of the worst to come into my life. Um, but the but the mercy that God extended to me and the grace that I that I experienced in that time taught me so much more about the father's love than I'd ever understood and um you know as a father the last thing I want to do is whoop my kid mm-hmm. if I can look at him crossways or speak a word you know and I think God's a much better father than I'll ever dream of being and um, his grace and mercy is what really brought me to that place of brokenness and repentance. Because when I, when I expected the hammer to fall, grace fell in my life. Mm. 
Matt, that is that's some powerful stuff. And I tell you, just from all of us here at the RFP, man, I mean, we we love your heart. Um, you know, Nate told me when we got to Vegas, he's like, have you met Dudley? And I was like, I don't know who this guy is. I've seen him on social media and just meeting you in Vegas and hearing your heart tonight, man, you're the real deal. And, uh, it, God's got his hand all over you for sure. And, uh, it's just awesome to see how he's using you and uh, your story. This story, this episode is going to help a lot of people. Um, a lot of folks that are listening to the RFP, a lot of people that don't want anything to do with the RFP, God's going to use this to help them. Yeah, and Matt, I had a chance to sit at uh, Cracker Barrel in Chattanooga, Tennessee, a <laughs> few months back with you and your family, which was the first time I had met your kids. And those boys were awesome. Just really enjoyed hanging out with them and seeing how God's work in your life was affecting and preserving your kids and mm. building yeah, they're awesome, a man. real faith in them and seeing talking to each one of them about their giftings and their passions and how they're working and serving in the church and what their plans are, man, I'm just excited for what God's doing in your life and in your family's life. Stephanie is amazing. My wife loves Stephanie Hmm. and man, she is, she is just so you don't, you don't really know a man until you know his family and uh, she just completes you so well. And I get you guys so much knowing your story and knowing what you've walked through, man, you're such a testimony and a trophy to God's grace. And I really appreciate you sharing tonight. I don't appreciate all the crying that I had to do tonight, listening to your story (laughs) again, but man, that was, that was awesome. And I know it's going to change some people's lives. Dude, you are such a ginger ninja. You just are. (laughs) (laughs) You got that velvet brick, baby. (laughs) I'm fighting words. I think next week would be a good place to pick up. You hit on it just a little bit, but talking about the fraternity of brotherhood of IFB pastors, because if you see one thing on Twitter and social media, it's all these guys saying that we're not a part of a fraternity. We're not with anybody else, but they are. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, uh, to put that eloquently, that's bull crap. <laughs> exactly. And I there's, think we need to talk about that next week. There's definitely a brotherhood. There's a fraternity. Um, I have told you guys, I think this, I I at least told Nathan this, I wish the RFP was around eight years ago when I went through that whole deal. But, man, I'm sure glad you're here now. Mm. And it was exciting uh, to to find your podcast during the COVID. I think I started listening around May, April or May last year. Yeah. And I thought, man, these guys are pretty cool. I wanted to meet Nathan, you know. No, I'm just kidding. I don't have a, I don't have a, uh, You know, Josh Tice fanboyed on you. I thought I'd, I'd just yeah, play into that a little bit. Yeah, he did. Well, you listened but, last uh, week, didn't you? So, so Oh, I, yeah, I that was embarrassing, by the way. <laughs> yeah. That, that was, was embarrassing. Part of our intention, so there you go. Yeah. That's funny. To embarrass me, you did. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Next week is going to be fire. Yeah, it's next gonna, We're going to we take need, off the gloves, brother. We need hey, to. Hey, yeah. man. Yep. It's a cage match yep. next week. I'm yeah. excited. We want to thank our sponsor, Free Life Soap, for being a great supporter of the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. Go to recoveringfundamentalist.org. Use your promo code RFP when you check out to get 20% off of your order. We also want to thank our patrons of Patreon. Uh, These are some incredible folks that give, that keep us on the air each and every week. And, uh, man, we are so thankful for them. Guys, it's been a good week. Matt, thanks for sharing your story. Looking forward to next week. It's going to be awesome. Y'all have a great week. Be sweet. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. Be sure to stop by our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Give us a follow. Also, go to our website, recoveringfundamentalist.org. That's recoveringfundamentalist.org. There you can find Recovering Fundamentalist swag. You can get your t-shirts and hats. You can join our ex-fundy community. See where we're going to be having some meetups. It's the recoveringfundamentalist.org. Be sure to join us next time for the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast.